talk about the Metropolitan Police Commissioner, Sir Mark Rowley, first up, because he's under pressure to ban a pro-Palestinian march planned for Armistice Day after growing calls to cancel Saturday's rally amid fears that the protests will turn violent. Oliver Dowden, the Deputy Prime Minister, has expressed grave concerns over the planned demonstration, with senior Tories also demanding that the march be cancelled. Joining me to discuss this and a plethora of other topics in the studio for my very first primetime show uh, is none other than the legendary Peter Hitchens. And I'm very pleased that he's here. Good evening, Peter. Good evening. Welcome to the first ever primetime independent Republican Mike Graham. Um, I think we're going to be able to set out our stall. We're going to be able to put a few things to rights. Um, my first question to you is, do you think my freedom of speech speech is a bit inconsistent? Because while asking for freedom of speech, I want these people not to march at the weekend. Look, there are limits to freedom of speech, mm. and there are two limits. One is the clear limit that you can't, you can't incite to violence or do any of the equivalent things. Yeah. You can't use that speech to make, uh, make people's lives worse in physical fashion. You could yeah. say what you think. You can urge others to believe what you think. You can say things which upset other people, but you cannot incite to violence. The other is the fact that you have freedom of speech doesn't necessarily mean you have to use it to the full. Right. It, doesn't, it doesn't mean you're, you're, because you're able to be fantastically rude to other people and to upset them, that you have to do so. Right. On the contrary, the fact that you have the freedom gives you the responsibility to use it wisely. In the end, a society where people will not use freedom of speech wisely will be a society where there'll be more and more calls for it to be limited and eventually destroyed. And that's one of the things I fear. So, no, it's, it's, it's very difficult to, to, to actually come up with a position which is wholly and totally consistent. I, I am, for instance, utterly against the, anything to do with the incitement of violence, but I will stand hugely for the freedom of speech whose views, for people whose views actively disgust me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the thing is, that is the crux of the matter. But I wonder as well, a bit like the Just Stop All arguments that we have, and they were out there today throwing um, or throwing themselves down in front of the cenotaph and, and breaking uh, glass on another piece of art uh, in a museum, where, you know, it's up to a point OK to demonstrate. But if you're going to keep demonstrating every single weekend like the pro-Palestinian crowd are, and under the circumstances of this weekend coming up, I don't think it's too much to ask to request them uh, although I don't think it's the police's job, which they have done, to request them, to request them to say, look, just take a week off. Well, but you can only request. Yeah. And this, this, is, this is the problem. We are, the, the freedoms which you spoke about, which have been, been obtained over centuries of, of struggle within the country and other centuries of fighting outside the country to protect us from foreign invasion, those freedoms don't include the, the banning of demonstrations and, and flooding the streets with riot squads, as some countries would do. Right. That's precisely what we fought for. So these people have to be permitted to have their demonstrations, in my view, if they must. I would personally, and my, my own view, and I would address them directly as saying so, I think you should call it off mm. because it's bad manners. Right. Uh, and they've Sat been asked Saturday, for particularly, it's bad yes. manners. Because Saturday is a very precious day to a lot of people, particularly mm. those who, who've, who've lost close relatives in war. Mm. It's not just any old day. It's not a political day. No. It's an unpolitical day. Right. It's a day on which people would like to be left to mourn uh, deeply and, uh, and, and peacefully, in, in some cases in actual silence, mm. uh, for those who were lost. And I think it's a shame that anybody should want to hold a, a raucous and yes. angry demonstration in London on that day. And they should have known better. They mm. still should. It's not too late. And actually, do you know what? They would gain greatly in the They really would. If they said, actually, you're quite right. We shouldn't have scheduled it for that day. We've had a demonstration every week. What is it, for a month? Let's leave this one and come back the following yeah. week. But I think they won't do that because ostensibly the people who organise these particular demonstrations have no time particularly for the military people of this country because I think an awful lot of the, the, the kind of the narrative that we're being fed is that this whole pro-Palestine belief system is being fed by this kind of social justice movement from the left where well, possibly. colonialism was wrong, you know, foreign wars were wrong, the First and Second World War were probably wrong, and they're not interested, really. Possibly. But then again, quite a lot of the people who might have thought of going on that demonstration, the sort of people who, who feel moved, and I, I understand why they do. I, I disagree with a lot of what they say, but I understand particularly why people would be distressed by what they see going on in Gaza. Mm. A lot of those people might also be the kind of people who think, actually, yes, Armistice Day is important to others. Perhaps I will stay away. Mm. So even if they won't call it off, then perhaps a lot of the more reasonable people who are thinking of taking part will just stay at home, right. which would be a good thing. 
Yeah. Well, let's have a look. Let's encourage that if any of our well, friends and absolutely. neighbors are thinking of going. So I think, look, not this time. Yeah. I mean, I think you can probably appeal to the better nature of some of those people who might be the stragglers and kind of the people that think that they want justice in, in, in Palestine. Let's but, assume so. Let's assume so. But the Israeli president, um, Isaac Herzog, spoke earlier to Piers Morgan on Piers Morgan Uncensored. Here's what he thinks. It's a atrocious and hypocritic and I call upon all decent human beings to object to the march and ban it because the symbol of that day is a symbol of victory and it's, it's a symbol of doing good because when you fight evil sometimes you have to fight you have to fight evil in order to uproot evil and do you know it's almost a month since the atrocities of October yes, the seventh. Uh, tomorrow will be a month, yep. um, and it seems amazing that the world, rather than focusing on that, and even focusing, and we've spoken about this before, yep. the, the hostages who are still held, which include a nine-month-old baby and several elderly um, people, um, that the focus is not on that, but it's actually on what Israel's doing and well, what do, Israel has the right to do. I do believe that this is, uh, this is actually a problem caused by the Israeli government. I think they have reacted mistakenly to these events. And people will say to me, well, what else could they do but bombard Gaza? And I say, well, there are many, many things which they could do, the first of which is immediately to strengthen uh, the defences which were so easily broken through uh, by the pogrom merchants on October the 7th, so that that doesn't happen again. Mm. But to me, the, here's, here's the most profound thing. Israel, when it, was, when it was begun in 1948, had the sympathy of a large part of the world because at that time, memories were very fresh mm. of, of, of what had been demonstrated beyond doubt by Hitler and the Third Reich, is that there are people on this earth who hate Jews because mm. they're Jews. Yeah and will kill them because people say, uh, well, why do they kill people because of their religion? It's a complete misunderstanding. Uh, one case particularly stands out in my mind, which is not widely enough known, uh, of Edith Stein. Mm. Edith Stein was a, a, a German citizen who was, who, who was brought up as a Jew and she became a Roman Catholic nun and theologian. Right. She was dragged from her convent in the Netherlands by the Gestapo to be killed in Auschwitz, mm. not because of her opinions, but because she was Jewish by birth mm. and ancestry. That is the nature of this thing. People hate Jews because they're Jews. And in 1948, everybody knew that. And for many years, Israel's existence depended on a worldwide understanding mm. that this was the last place of refuge for people who, if they had nowhere to go, would be and could be murdered if, if the Third Reich arose again or something mm. similar. That was completely understood. Since the 1960s, for some reason, the left which used to support Israel and used to be much more in support of Israel than the right, has shifted over uh, to support for the, for, for the opposite cause. And the, Israel has been losing the propaganda war, I think, yeah. since 1967 when it occupied the West Bank. Here was an absolute demonstration uh, by Hamas on October the 7th that, in fact, the, the resentment of Israel, which is always characterized as, as a resentment of the, 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 the stealing of land, uh, or the mistreatment of, 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 of individual Arab citizens, or whatever it might be, was actually not about that at all. Mm. That the fundamental reason why Israel has to defend itself all the time is because there are people, not all the people, but there are people in the Middle East who hate Jews so much that they will kill them when they get right. the chance. Israel had, on that occasion, this extraordinary chance to point this out to the world, which has forgotten it. And instead of doing that, Israel bombarded Gaza. Now, I think uh, I am, I am a, a probably a more hardline supporter of Israel than anybody I know. But I think this is a grave mistake, both politically and militarily, and from the propaganda point of view, and also morally, because I think you cannot, in the end, uh, pretend to yourself that if you pour high explosive into a densely populated city, that you that you do not know that you're going to kill innocent people. But given that a month has passed, I mean, I've had this argument with several people, including my own children, funnily enough, over the weekend. Um, is it not the case that if Israel was doing what they're alleged to be doing, which is to, to, to be kind of indiscriminately bombing Gaza, then there would be an awful lot of casualties. There would be an awful lot of more death than we're seeing because what we are seeing only uh, are the figures coming out of Hamas uh, and their health ministry as far as the casualty list is concerned. Well, I mean, I'm not the Israelis don't dispute the numbers of people no. dying, but what they do dispute is who is actually being killed. And they say they're killing Hamas fighters, of which there are 40,000. Well, no doubt they are killing some Hamas fighters. And the, I, the, there is, in, in my view, a moral difference between the... the the, the racist massacre of October the 7th and what Israel is doing, 
But it's not a big enough moral difference to make me say, oh, well, that's all right then. The bombing of Gaza is all right. Many nations, it's not just Israel, have in, in recent years, the, the United States and Britain, when, when we were putting down ISIS uh, in Mosul and Raqqa, uh, the Russians, when they were, when, when they were fighting the, uh, the Al-Qaeda forces in Aleppo, uh, in the Americans in the latter stages of the Iraq war, when they were, when they were pounding Fallujah, mm. and indeed the Iraqi government, when they were doing it, they used these methods. Mm. They're accepted. Mm. Uh, and it's interesting that, that, that the criticism of them is only really intensifies uh, when it's Israel doing it, which is yeah. one of the, it illustrates to me one of the problems of Israel, that it's selectively criticized for doing things other people do and get away with. But I find this form of warfare repulsive. Mm. Whoever does it, I don't think the bombing of populated cities, when you know that you're going to kill innocent people in large numbers, is justifiable under these circumstances. And I'd also, I think it's, it's almost certainly militarily and politically ineffective. I recommend everybody who's interested in this to watch one of the greatest films ever made, The Battle of Algiers, uh -huh. which describes the French using every means of force and, and actually as torture as well uh, to destroy the, the, the Algerian rebels against French rule. And it, they appeared to have succeeded. And the end of the film is, first of all, they appear to have succeeded, and then they discover a, a year or two later that, in fact, they haven't succeeded at all. The movement they sought to destroy has risen again mm. and then throws them out of Algeria for good. This form of warfare does not work. What, if, what is Israel going to do if it, I open inverted commas here, defeats Hamas in these, in these events? What, what, is it, what is Hamas going to be replaced by? Well, this is the problem. There are, there are two million people in, in, in Gaza. I think I have the, the count right. They, they, they will have to choose an, another government. Who, who will they choose? Well, they could choose the, the, uh, the Palestinian Authority, which well, is another I subject. I very much doubt uh, it. Uh, which which, uh, which uh, was suggested by um, Secretary of State Blinken just the other day, uh, and he got pretty blank looks, I'm afraid, in the West Bank. But I would think coming up, would, yeah. uh, more from Peter Hitchens, we're going to try and find out exactly what uh, we can do uh, to stop these marches at this particular moment in time. But also, we'll be talking more about that later on uh, with a barrister uh, and a former Metropolitan Police Commissioner as well. But coming up, uh, we're also going to find out what Peter Hitchens made of the COVID COVID inquiry this week. See you after this. Welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. We are now in prime time. Peter Hitchens is still with me. We've got lots to discuss. Peter, uh, welcome back to uh, the prime time studio. Uh, here we are from 9 to 11 every Monday to Thursday night right here on Talk TV, right after Piers Morgan Uncensored, uh, which is a great honour for me personally. Let's talk a bit about the COVID inquiry. I loved your column this week uh, in which we finally found a use for a lockdown, it seems to me, that uh, your suggestion yeah, I... was to lock down everybody responsible for it. Oh, the, the inquiry, they should be sent home, <laughs> told. Now go to your homes. As yes. I remember, we were all, t all told. In the, in, the, in the spring of, of, golly, when was it, 2020? I right. It's all gone now. But, it but does we, seem we, like a different we era. We all told. Well, yes, when, it's what brought us together. Mm. But we, we all took, you know, onto the television comes the Prime Minister, says, go home and stay there. Right. You, you can have some permitted exercise. And then the police <laughs> appeared and the, the suntan squad arrived and drove people out of parks and off beaches and rounded them up for right. walking on the high hills. And, OK, let them have a dose of that, because what use are they doing? What, mm. use, what good are they doing? Yeah. I, the, I drew my, the, everybody's attention to the appalling treatment of Professor Carl Hennigan, yes. who, in the darkest hours of the, of the Great Panic, was one of the few people in, in, in science and mm. medicine who kept uh, a, a respectable position up of saying, actually, this, I have serious doubts about this. A man who practices, by the way, as a GP, as well as being a scientist, and who knows what goes on in the health service and is really well briefed and is not it isn't overbearing or overweening but just simply and it's a very puts, calm voice exactly, actually, put it? forward in, a, in yeah. a calm and intelligent way doubts about what was going on and mm. the way the inquiry treated him I had some somebody asking him whether he whether people had been swearing about him why, 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 why do you ask that yeah and he submitted as I think a 74 page document and didn't yes. get the impression anybody had read it. I don't it's think anybody did fantastic uh, article in The Spectator, which he wrote last week, which, which I think is reachable online. Everybody should read it to see how this, this person, who should really be treasured yeah. as a very important part of our, of, of our scientific and, uh, and, 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 and public knowledge, was, was treated dismissively uh, by an inquiry which seems to me to have made up his mind in advance. Well, I, I, well, I predicted I... before it was set up right. that it would say uh, we did not lock down 
uh, soon enough or hard enough. Right. That's what it will say. Yes. And, uh, that's, that's, it's not and that is still the line that comes out of any former government minister or yeah. any current government minister if you try and pick them apart on it. But also, they seem obsessed with asking the wrong questions. I kind of summarised the thing last week as saying, you know, the inquiry which is taking too long will cost too much money and is asking all the wrong questions. Yeah. Because they seemed obsessed last week with Dominic Cummings and his sweary WhatsApps rather than what was actually the chaotic nature of, of government policy being made. Well, and why was it chaotic? And what was the reason for the chaos? And, uh, and, and, were, and fundamentally, were they taking the right decisions? Had, it, had anybody done the simplest thing that people should do under such circumstances, mm. a simple cost-benefit analysis, yeah. which they never did. No. At no stage did the government make any effort to, to match the, the cost of what they were doing with the benefits they were obtaining. And that's the most fundamental yeah. action which they should have taken. And they aren't doing that. And I know you're they're not... They're not interested. The, the idea that it may have been a mistake has not entered no, their minds. No, that's not allowable, is it? Because I know um, that most people will, will realise you're not a big fan of Boris Johnson's, but I wonder whether when you saw that he had said, and asked the questions actually that you were asking, you know, is it actually a good idea um, to stop the entire economy if the only people we're going to save are people who are going to die anyway? Now, he was accused of being all kinds of yes, ghastliness and horribleness and didn't care about old people, but it's a good question, isn't it? Well, yes, though I think if you ask it in that way, people are entitled to say, well, do you not care about old people? I, I don't think I would have put it like mm. that. I think you should tr have tried as hard as you could to pr protect the old people as much as you could, but not at the expense of destroying the whole of society. Yeah. This is the balance that I've said again and again. It's, it's like burning down the house to get rid of the wasp. Mm. It's an overreaction. I think the problem with Johnson is that he has within him some instincts for... Uh, for uh, he's not a stupid person, he ha and he has some instincts against being ordered to do idiotic things, but he was ultimately overborne yeah. by the Whitehall machine and forced into doing something he didn't really want to do. But he didn't have enough conviction. No. Because he doesn't really, in my view, believe in anything. He didn't have enough conviction to actually fight against these people as they should have been fought against. And that was his failure. And I think we have to, we have to mark him down for that. But if you don't, he wanted to be prime minister. If you want to be prime minister, you sometimes have to be the only man in the room saying, no, right. I'm not doing this. This is what I'm exactly. doing. I don't care what you say. My convictions go in the opposite direction. That's why I'm prime minister and mm. you're not. If he'd done that and we'd done what Sweden yeah. did, the benefits to the country would have been huge. Because let's face it, in, in correct distance, he actually wanted to be king of the world, didn't he? I mean, well, he ended up with prime minister, which was a bit of a disappointment for him. I don't think even Theresa May ended up <laughs> as prime minister by accident. <laughs> No, but again, I mean, I take issue with some of the, the, the Dominic Cummings um, sort of statements because he was talking in very loose terms about how useless everybody was. And I'm thinking, well, hang on a minute, you were part of this so-called useless well, machine. Who, 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 um, who exactly are you talking about? And you can't surely be painting yourself as the only, you know, sensible man in a sea of absolute and utter idiots. idiots but you but know? all these people seem to resemble to me a group of people who've gone into, in, into a bar where, they, where the only drink on sale is power. Mm and they want to get up as close to the bar as possible and drink as much of it as they can. Yeah. It was power. Right. Not, not how it was used, but that it was in their hands that mattered to them, yes. as far as I can see. And this is what happens to people. This is what the, the, famous, the famous saying that power tends to corrupt is true. Yeah. It does bad things to people. It does. And we've seen it because what looks as though what started off as a nest of vipers it's kind of deteriorated into something even much worse, a little bit like two rats in a, in a sack basically eating each other until one of them was, was dead. Something like that. But it's absolutely horrendous. Boris Johnson popped up, of course, um, uh, in the last couple of days over in Israel, and a lot of his supporters went, that's, why, uh, that's where he should be, that's, he, that's his job, being a statesman. But you do wonder sometimes he's whether... He's not very good at that either. He's not really the greatest statesman. I, I, he's good at going to places like Ukraine and getting hamburgers named after him <laughs> and getting streets named after him. But, I mean, he didn't really achieve that much, did well, he? Well, I used to do... Uh, when he was Foreign Secretary, I used to read his speeches. Here he is in Israel. And they were not, they were not inspiring. Um, no. I think for those of us who deal in words, you know, perhaps we're not as impressed with him as other people was were. He but he was a great campaigner and he got Brexit done, albeit I know it wasn't done properly. Yeah, well, he didn't but, you know, properly, he got it yeah. done better than most people would have done. Let's talk about the ne possible next head uh, or leader of the Conservative Party, Suella Braverman. She's come out this oh, week goodness. and decided to issue yet another uh, what is being described as a cruel statement, which is that people who sleep on the streets in tents are homeless because they want to be. Yes, dear me. Um, <laughs> it's very difficult to know what to do when people start behaving like that, isn't it? It really uh, is. It, 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 it seems like she's deliberately just trying... Strive trying. not to be unkind. Mm. Uh, I've never been impressed with uh, 
Ms. Brum. No. And I'm afraid I'm, I'm not now. It's, it, it, but she maybe is trying to appeal to some mythical constituency she thinks is out. This is what I'm hearing. I'm hearing that she's trying to uh, basically make herself ever more popular with the sort of right-wing people in the... Not just yeah. in the party, but in the, in, the, in the Westminster party, so that she can become the next... Conservative leader. Well, it may work, but what will she be leader of in that case? Because if if they lose the election, as they seem very likely to do, and there's a tiny rump, it right. won't be much of a thing to be leader of. No, it'll, it'll be like a cracked Ming vase to bring the old uh, Keir Starmer thing in. I think be, they'll be spending the entire <laughs> next five years with with a pot of glue trying to stick <laughs> the Ming vase together again. Which yeah. They, which they, I, I don't, I don't, I don't really think that any of them have really understood how low they've sunk in the estimation of the public. Uh, and as and it's it's a shame because the the problem with all this is that it puts it puts Keir Starmer and the Blairites back in power mm. for, the, for, for the first time. And it's very much the twenty ten. And we don't, it is extremely Blairite, and therefore it will, when it comes to power, be enormously radical, very high tax, very redistributive, and people will hate it very quickly. And they'll say, "Why did we vote right. for this lot?" And, and, and they'll, then they'll remember they voted for them because they hated the Tories. And then they might. I think they... you may hate the Tories now, but you wait and see how much you hate Labour within three years of them coming to power. And there'll be more people saying you should have listened to Peter Hitchens. Well, that's I, I, that's my life. They always <laughs> listen to me when it's too late to be any use. It's true because for I once, wonder. I wonder whether Tony Blair. When it matters. I wonder whether Tony Blair sits in his, his now magnificent um, sort of um, residence, which he now has several of, um, counting his money, and wonders whether there's bits that he could have finished and bits that he could have done before he left office and he want Keir Starmer to carry those on. I think, well, the th I don't think Blair ever really understood what his government was doing. I think there were people in his government who did understand. Mm. I think he was always a figurehead for it. I, I, th I think that he, to some extent, he was an effective figurehead because he really didn't know what was going on and could, and, and could therefore act innocent, because he was. Mm. But Alistair Campbell wasn't innocent and Peter Mandelson wasn't innocent. And Gordon Brown wasn't innocent. They yeah. all had an incredibly radical program, which mm. they wanted to they wanted to implement, uh, frankly, for, uh, for the next twenty or thirty years yeah. until the country was totally transformed. And they 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 achieved a lot of that, and then they they turned the Conservative Party into their pretty much their servant. Mm. So nothing that the Tory Party have done since they came back into office has undermined any of the things that they did. No. And there we are. But I warn you, if you think that the Starmer government's going to be some kind of moderate interlude, you're in for a surprise. Yeah, no, I fear you're absolutely right. Once again, I'm afraid. Peter Hitchens, ladies and gentlemen, uh, here for the first ever primetime independent republic of Mike Graham. We'll see him every Monday.